Gray, welcome to the shield. Let's stand to our feet and let's praise the Lord together. God bless you.
Just take a second to tell him how much you love him. Thank him for all the beautiful things he's done in your life. All the, all the ways he's made himself so tangible to you. All the ways he's loved you and told you you're worth it and you're special. All the beautiful things he's created you to be. Thank you, Jesus.
We started off singing about the power in the blood. Nothing like the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we just began to enter into how he seats us and how he's after us. And we just closed this worship songs at this time about his love, his blood, his desire for you to be one with him, and this love that passes all understanding that how a people that once were Gentiles could be engrafted into the household of faith and of God to be cleansed and forgiven to be woven into his righteousness to be brought into the place that he is the price that he paid for the place that he made for us for he has decreed I have prepared a place for you in the presence of your enemies and that place is in him we are hid in Christ Jesus, where our enemies cannot find us, only Christ, and he is our victory. And we give him the praise, the glory, and the honor. And everybody give him a shout. Glory be to God. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. You may be seated. How's everyone doing today? Great. You all look great, and you look like you're getting better. Thank the Lord. 
those songs were so beautiful just letting us know how Christ is in us and for us when we give our tithes and offers we give it unto him not to Pastor Larry not to the shield but we give it unto the Lord so just think about that when you give your tithes and offerings it's not about this place it's about him in us the gap outreach is going to be on the right and the left and yesterday we went to uh, White Oak Manor and they really enjoyed the shield so I want to thank y'all for giving your dime your dollar or if you give more it's really appreciated because they really look forward to us coming I want to welcome the online viewers good morning welcome to the shield our mission this month is for Patrick Brown in Nicaragua a Christian ministry who believe in using humanitarian aids to open the hearts of children, families, the entire village to the love of God. Do we have a um, uh, scripture? Ushers can come on up. I'm just going to go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you for your presence because in your presence there's fullness of joy. I just thank you for the body at the shield the body of Christ. Lord, I just thank you for helping us to do what's right in your sight. Whatever we do, Lord, we do it unto you. We thank you and we praise you. Thank you for this blessed, victorious day. In Jesus' my name, amen. week in Christ Jesus has been. It's been wonderful. We're in the book of Colossians, and now that we're into the second chapter of it, it's very interesting because the second chapter is about a warning. And even though the Apostle Paul had never been to Lacedaemon or Colossae, he yet was getting so much information about what was happening there and how God was moving, and he was so impressed with what was happening there. I mean, it was just a great move of God, and then all of a sudden, a whole lot of people came in wanting to bring some uh, religious traditions and things of the flesh, old ordinances, doing things like we used to do, and begin to corrupt exactly what Jesus came to establish. And so even though he was in prison, the revelation knowledge of who Christ is in us was given to him a great mystery that had been revealed that had been hidden from the foundations of the whole world but now it's manifested in Christ Jesus and Paul getting that revelation as he said in Galatians 3 12 hey I didn't get this from man I got it by the revelation of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden here comes words of correction and encouragement to the church which really helped them so much I could liken it unto things that happen today in, in, lo, in the local churches. You can go out on your jobs and people go, where do you go to church? Well, I go to this one. Where do you go? I go to that one. Uh, well, what day of the week do y'all worship? Well, we worship on Sunday. Uh, well, I hate to inform you this, but you guys really aren't right with God. You're not worshiping on Saturday. And so vice versa, I've heard people, y'all worship on Saturday? Oh, there's something wrong with you. And it's exactly what was going on in Colossae. They were getting into so much stuff, and he wanted to bring everybody back into the mind of Christ and to understand that ordinances and religious traditions and all of those things in the past were types and shadows to show us things of what's to come. And he's saying, now what was to come is here. See, if we're not careful, we keep waiting for something to come. That's like the people that are still waiting for the kingdom of God to come. It's like being in Colossae and they knew, but here come people tell them, no, it's not here yet. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest things that that church was attacked with is that Jesus is not God. And that's the biggest writing that Paul has in here. In Colossae is the revelation of who he is. He makes it very simple that in Christ Jesus, all of it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he had to bring a great correction to this. And so his correction out of prison 
comes into our life and takes us out of the prison that's in us and sets us free in Christ Jesus. Isn't it amazing that you can have the most corrupt sin that you could think of, any sexual impurity, no matter how often, how many times in your life that you have done something, but by the power of his blood and his mind and his works and everything that he did, he receives you clean and whole and perfect. And you're little, if you're carnal, you know your mind is like impossible. I don't deserve that. You can't do that. No, it's just no way. But when your mind gets renewed in Christ, you go, wow. From the foundations of the earth before they were ever laid, God had DNA in him that had been spoken out of his mouth that when you got into the earth, his DNA would come in you. And all of a sudden, your old nature DNA dies and a new DNA arise. And now it's not you that liveth, but Christ who lives in you. you say, oh, brother, that sounds good, but I make a lot of mistakes and I blow it. That's what you call growing. It's like children. They don't intentionally want to fall down and get hurt, but they do but we have to help them get up. My little two-year-old so funny, I don't care what happens. He'll come to me and he'll say, I heard. He'll put his finger on, I heard. And I'll say, here, I'll kiss it and it'll go away. And I, in Jesus' name, like that. He'll say, thank you, and take off. But he'll stand there and say, I hurt, I hurt, until I give him that little kiss. And if we could just learn that the kingdom of God is just exactly like a child, and the kingdom is here because it's within you. If it's not here, it can't be in you. And Jesus said, you take care, you watch out. Because the day's coming, people are going to tell you the kingdom's over here, the kingdom's over there. It's not yet. He said, but behold, you take notice and listen up. The kingdom of God is within you. And so I'm able to walk around every day knowing that King Jesus lives in Larry. And he made me a priest and a king, so now I'm King Larry. I do miss my wife a lot because I used to come home and say, Hello, King Kathy. And she'd say, Hey, King Larry. Because we understood who we were in Christ Jesus. Because it wasn't about her being a woman to be a king or to be a priest. It was about being in Christ. And Oh, well, you better get on with it here. I tell you, I'm going to let them put up Colossians in the King James Version. And I'm going to continue to read it out of the Passion. But I'm just going to back up for just a second here. Let me put these on. I got tickled. Somebody said he wears glasses. Well, pray for me. Amen. All of us have to go through things different than other people. Amen. Well, we do. We just deal with stuff that others never know about. You would have never known that I've been drenched in Agent Orange for a long time, would you? I, I'm doing a whole lot better than most soldiers I know. As a matter of fact, on the DMZ in Korea from June of 1969 to June of 1972, it was the most saturated place of Agent Orange. If you were even close to that place, it wasn't even on the DMZ. They, if you have any of the effects of it, they'll work with you because of it. And so I got to be there uh, beginning in January of 1971. So I was right in the middle of it, and I didn't even understand the effects of it. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know anything. I remember after being out, meeting a good friend of mine, Walter Dennis in Vietnam. And he says, man, I'm just, I'm just really dealing with this Agent Orange. And I thought, you are? Why? And he started telling me about it, and I'm going, really? I never said anything about where I was or what I was going through. And so on top of how we, what's my point? On top of how we overcome things in life, on top of all the other things that come against you at home and life itself, some of us have been through things in life that we have an additional battle that a lot of you were never offered to. And vice versa, some of you have been given some battles nobody knows anything about, they'll never even experience. And so we have to learn that it's in Christ Jesus that we live and move and have our being. Because Agent Orange is under the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. That's who I go to about Agent Orange. That's who I go to about a toothache. Oh, you say, you don't go to a dentist? Yes, I go to dentist. But come on, I carry everything, everything to God. Everything. Amen. When I get dirty, this may embarrass you, but I actually take a shower. I don't confess I'm clean. 
okay? That, that'll hit you a little bit later. I'm going to back up into uh, chapter 1 of verse 2. I want you to, because I want you to understand the Bible's not written from chapter to chapter. It's written thought to thought. And when men put chapters and verses, it was for cross-reference. And so a lot of times you read it, a chapter and close it. And I say quite often, it's probably boring for you to hear me say this, but there's always somebody that hasn't heard this. Can I get an amen? Please just read a few more verses, especially if chapter, the, after you finish, the next chapter says, therefore, or has a big and in front of it, or because. Continue to reading if, if you see a junction word, because if you don't, you're going to close your Bible, open it back up, and start in the next chapter, and go, I don't get it. So, but when you get it from thought to the end of a thought, you get it. I'm just helping you learn the simplicity of the Bible. All right. I read in, in 120, 28 and 9, Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth. To bring every person into the full understanding of truth. It has become my inspiration and my passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity, with his power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being perfect in one in Christ Jesus. Now, you got to understand, he knows who he's writing to and why. He's never been there, but he knows what's going on. He's getting, he's getting Timothys and the rest of them that have been there, that know what's going on, that are keeping him totally informed. And the revelation knowledge of God is coming out of him, and he is beginning to pour it out unto them. The revelation of being his perfect one. That word perfect, see, it messes your mind up, but only if it's carnal. If it's spiritual, you get it. You go, I understand it. It's not my mind. It's his mind. He said, let this mind that's in Christ Jesus be in you. Well, that's a perfect mind. Are y'all all right out there? I'm telling you, God steps right into your imperfection and puts his perfection all over you. He stepped right into your sinful life and just wiped it out and cleaned it up and gave you his holiness. Not what you did, what he did. And then in chapter 2, he begins to bring a warning. And as he brings this warning, he does it in such a great, powerful love, a compassion. Like a mama would warn her child of something dangerous. He said, oh, I wish that you could know how much I have struggled for you and for the church in Lacedaemonia, and for the many other friends that I have yet to meet. I'm contending for you that your hearts will be wrapped in the comfort of heaven and woven together into love's fabric. Now watch this. This will give you access all of the riches of God as you experience the revelation of God's great mystery experience a lot of folks just hear they never experience when I counsel people I talk to them about the Bible says be doers of the word and not hearers only and when I counsel folks a lot of times when we're finished that's what they'll say is we know that we know that and I go, yeah, you know it, but you got to do it. So I'll reword it for you so you can understand it. Don't be just knowers of the word. Be doers. So you hear it and hear it and hear it, and you know it, know it, know it. But it's no good until you do it, do it, do it. Are you all right? Everything's in threes. Okay. <laughs> for our spiritual wealth, I love being wealthy. Our spiritual wealth is in him like hidden treasure waiting to be discovered. You get up every morning, there's a hidden treasure in you waiting to be discovered. Every day is fresh and new. His faithfulness is fresh. It's new each and every morning. It's not old dust from yesterday. It's clean. Somebody say amen. Heaven's wisdom and endless riches of revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge. That's the reason the enemy loves it when preachers go preach on sin instead of the kingdom. Because if I preach on sin, I can get you feeling guilty. But if I preach the revelation knowledge of Christ, it'll bring a conviction. And when you see that he loved you so much that even in the midst of your sins, he gave himself for you, it makes you want to open your heart up and say, that's an amazing love. I received that. I received that love. But see, if I preach on sin 
and I preach on how bad you smoke, drink, dip, and chew, and mess with them that do, and you're going to come to the altar and say, I'm so sorry for all those things that I did, but you don't invite him into your heart. You're just sorry, and you walk out the door. The conviction wears up. You're doing what you were doing before. Nothing's changed. Where does the change come from? Him. It's when his DNA gets down in you. And believe it or not, it comes through your ears. Oh, yeah. His DNA comes through your ears. It's the hearing of faith, the Bible says. The riches of the revelation knowledge. I want you to know this so that no one will come and lead you into error through their persuasive arguments and their clever words. You know anybody like that? Listen, I preached at Duke Power for years, and every preacher you can imagine that was out there come up to me because I'd preach faith, and I'd preach Christ and Him crucified, and I'd preach revelation knowledge, and they would get on me. Don't you know these construction workers, most of them are drunk and stoned right here on the job. Why don't you preach to them about what they're doing wrong? And I, I'd be like, man, you're so mad, and you sound so angry, and you're so frustrated. And people will do that. Your people are getting Christianity, and all they focus on is how other people are doing stuff wrong. Even in church, people look right. You're not worshiping right. You're not doing this right. You ought to pay more attention. You ought to this. You ought to worship God. As a matter of fact, if you would worship God, you'd probably increase the anointing and the experience in here. And the person that you're giving attention to instead of God, they might have an experience. And Please, don't try to correct them. Let God do it. Y'all not mad, are you? All right. Even though I am separated from you geographically, my spirit is present there with you. That's amazing. That Revelation that I'm not with you, but I'm with you. Same way with God. He's with me. And you say, but you, how do you see God? I see God by faith. I can look at creation and see God. I can look at people and see God. But by faith in Him, I have a vision and a revelation of Him living in me, walking in me, every fiber of my being. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When I pray for other believers, I say that a lot of times. I'm not just praying for you. I'm laying hands on God's house. God's house. That's why I don't sing that song, you know. I hadn't got time to fix the shutters I hadn't got time to fix the door I don't sing those songs I don't care anything about them because it's not this old house that I'm concerned about I live in a new house the house of Christ Jesus are you all right out there and so geographically my spirit is present excuse me even though I'm separated from you geographically my spirit is present there with you I am overjoyed I read Paul's writings and I, he's always expressing joy and love and happiness and peace and the dude is sitting in a dungeon and he's writing how excited he is. I don't even know if y'all ever go there. It makes me want to weep that there's such love come through him. And I, I just love him. I, I'm glad that he's called the Apostle Paul. There was 12 and you know Judas killed himself and then the 11 got together and they drew straws to have a 12th person. Y'all remember that? And so who did the straw? When they drew, who did it fall on? Matthias. So Matthias was named the 12th apostle. And after that, you never hear of Matthias again. The only time you heard of Matthias is when they drew a straw on him. But 20 years later, the Holy Spirit saw a man named Paul on his way to Damascus to destroy the church. And he came down upon him and Paul said, hey, I'm one out of season, meaning I wasn't one of the 12. And then he begins to be humbled about how God had marked him to become an apostle. See, those 11 wanted to pick who the apostle was, but God knew who he wanted. Oh, well, let me move on. And I'm overjoyed to see how disciplined and deeply committed you are because you have such a solid faith in Christ, the anointed one. So that's the thing that it concerned him. He knew about how solid the church was, how anchored it was. Now he's getting reports of people with cunning words coming in, beginning to tell people things, especially the part about Christ is not God. I even hear it even to this day. I've, I've heard preachers on radio and television say, I have no idea how people could believe that the Son of God is God. And I'm going, what is he doing preaching? 
what is he doing teaching? How could you not have an idea when the, even in the book of John starts off in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And it says, and the word, which was God, was made flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us. He took on human form and yet was God. And people never understood him because everything he went through, they said, look at him. He's trying to make himself as God. No, he was trying to make himself man. He was God. He wasn't trying to make himself God. Woo! I had to get loud with that one. It's like, it's like religious tradition comes in to kill that and to destroy that. Because the more you know how much Jesus was in Christ and Christ was in God and God was in Jesus and so on and so on, then he said, if you be in me and I'm in him, then we three are what? Woo! When you start walking down the street and driving your car knowing you won with God, that you are God's voice in the earth, you're his hands, his feet, his body. He's looking through you. He's talking through you. That's why we can't be judgmental. That's why you can't rebuke elders. That's why you can't go around and put your foot down and demand what you want. Because we're his. We're not our own. We belong to him, not ourselves. I'm overjoyed to see how disciplined and deeply committed you are because you have such a solid faith in Christ, the anointed one. And then he goes right into a new life about what's going on. In the same way you receive Jesus, our Lord, the Messiah, by faith. So everybody say, by faith. That's how you live. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing by the word of God, the anointed word. It increases your faith. And so he goes on to say, in the same way you receive Jesus, our Lord, Messiah, by faith, continue your journey in faith. Don't you let anybody stop your journey. You get in that Bible every morning. Every morning. I was just thinking, I only exercise 90 minutes a week physically. Seven years ago, I weighed 80 pounds more than I do right now. And I got to just thinking, 90 minutes a week, what it's done for my health is amazing. Well, we should be taking care of our spirit, our soul, and our body. And if we're not careful, you're going to give your body more time than you would the Word. And what in the world? Can you, how many of you can say, I spend more than 90 minutes a week in the Word? That's, that's about 15 minutes a day for six days. You can take Sunday and come in here and get your other 15 in here. <laughs> Y'all got me wanting to laugh at you. Well, I'm just telling you. How about meditating? Meditate on the Word 90 minutes. You think I'm kidding. What you can do to your body in 90 minutes a week, can you imagine what would happen to your spirit and your mind if you gave them 90 minutes a week? Oh, well, Pastor, I give it every minute of every night. Well, I'm proud of you, but I'm going to tell you, most of the people sitting around you don't. And I want to encourage you, not criticize you. I want to motivate you, not put you down. I want you to just stop and think. You know, that's just not that much time out of a week. You know, we talking about giving God a tithe of our time. Lord have mercy. That's a tithe of a tithe I'm talking about. You'd be surprised. You stick your nose in that word and start smelling it, you're going to smell God. You start looking, you're going to see God. You start listening, you're going to hear God. And after you get full of smelling and seeing and listening, when you open your mouth, guess what's going to come out of you? God. And it won't criticize. It won't condemn. It won't put other people down. It won't see itself puffed up and haughty. It won't see itself walking around making judgments against others. It'll come in and bring love and peace and forgiveness and redemption and strength and understanding and wisdom. My goodness. I'm about to preach myself happy. Woo, I might just give myself an offering. And then he says, continue your journey of faith. Progressing further into your union with him. Well, brother, I believe I'm about as far as you can get with him. No. You continue. Further your union. Further your union with him. Your spiritual roots. Roots. If you have no roots, you have no fruit. You have no branches. But Jesus said, I am the branch. He said in Hebrews, God is the root. And in John, he said, and you are the branch. Where does the fruits come from? The branches. We should be bearing fruit. I want to encourage you. I'm going to do what Joel Osteen said. Just because I heard him say it, 
How's this for being real spiritual? Man, grab somebody every week and just work on them to bring them to church. Because you know, and when they get them to church, they're going to get true worship. They're going to hear the word right out of the word. They won't be criticized, condemned, and put down. They'll be loved and motivated, encouraged and instructed in righteousness. And when they're given an invitation to receive Christ, it won't be embarrassing. It'll be holy. It'll be awesome and encouraging and receiving and wanting it. Man, I tell you, there's so many people that really want what you got. And if you can't just give it to them right there, then bring them to church. Tell them you'll come pick them up. Man, I just, if you really know that God loves others, you know there's got to be something in you that's reaching out to other people. I love doing it everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. And sometimes I end up in the midst of a bunch of old people like I used to be, and they're pretty rough. They talk pretty nasty, and they look pretty rough. But I know that once Christ gets in there, that, that person of all that nastiness is going to be cleaned up. That roughness is going to be smooth. I just know that crooked place is going to get made straight. God is looking for people because he's out looking for himself. God's looking for God. Nothing pleases God but God. That's why when you get in the word of God, it's about God. And it pleases God for you to seek him in the word because he's not going to show you you in the word. He's going to show you him in the word and the more you look at the word which is a mirror it reflects him and the next thing you know all you can see is him and so you don't see yourself in the mirror anymore you see christ when you look in the mirror and him crucified and living in you and glorified and coming out of you my goodness your spiritual roots go deeply into his life my roots are in his life my roots he's my soil where my nutrients come from as you continuously infuse with strength encouraged in every way in every way encouraged not discouraged for you are established in the faith boy he's telling those Colossians you've got such great roots you've done such a great job you've got such a wonderful revelation he said, and you've absorbed and enriched by your devotion to him. And then he's going, he, after he exalts and edifies and acknowledges how they're walking in him, he said, you beware that no one distracts you or imitates you, intimidates you in their attempt to lead you away from Christ's fullness by pretending to be full of wisdom when they're just filled with endless arguments of human logic. Oh, anybody that wants to argue, especially in front of anybody else, I have no desire. When they say, you show me in the Word, and other people, and they're argumentative, I wouldn't care how accurate in the Word I can show them. But I, don't want, I don't even want to discuss it any further. I drop it and go on about my business. God is not argumentative in the streets about who He is. Can I get an amen? He confirms who He is with signs, wonders, and miracles as we do the Word. Do it. Don't just know it. Do it. There's always a circumstance around you every day that you have an opportunity to show Christ. You'll always hear somebody say something. You know a word of prayer would help them. And that's the opportunity. Hey, can I just have a pray, pray with you? And I've had people tell me, but I'm not you. I can't pray like you. Well, I'm not you and I can't pray like you. But we all can pray. And praying is saying. It's not saying it like somebody else. It's saying what you believe in faith. And when they say, but you don't know what I'm going through, you can say, I don't, but the Holy Spirit knows what you're going through. And the Word says if we'll pray as we ought to pray, He said, but He's going to show you. He's going to help you. Here, let me pray with you. And you say, well, I don't know. Well, if it's a problem with marriage, it's simple. Father, I ask you to bring healing to this marriage. Open their eyes and bring wisdom and strength to them. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. You don't have to keep going unless you feel led to. I've said enough right there. If God answers that, we got some solutions going on. Amen? He said they operate with humanistic and clouded judgments. They are based on the mindset of this world system. That's called cosmos, order and arrangement of time and things. And not the anointed truths of the anointed one. Woo, glory to God. And then in verse 9, he says, for he is the complete fullness of God deity what why would you even want to argue about that you can read it and see it you ought to amen it 
He's the complete fullness of deity. Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's why when I baptize people in water, I always say I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that way when you run into people that go, were you baptized in the name of Jesus? You can go, I sure was. Are you all right? See, there's another one of those things Paul talking about. Were you baptized correctly? Did they say Father, Son, Holy Ghost? If they, I've heard this. If they did, you're not saved yet. That lying devil's got so many stupid things out there. Glory to God. You was baptized in the name of the Father of who he is, the Holy Spirit of who he is, and Jesus of who he is, and it was done in his name of whose you are. Amen. Because he is the complete fullness of deity, living in human form. He said, if I'm in him and you're in me, we three are one. Wow, you're in human form, and deity is in you. I know, you're sitting there wrestling with that. Well, now, brother, that's, that's pretty steep. That's, pretty, now, that's, the rub, that's the mystery that was hidden from the foundation of the world, that Christ would be in you, the anointed one would be in you. The Bible says if Satan had known that, he would have never crucified him. He had no idea he was multiplying Jesus Christ. He thought he was eliminating him. And our own completeness is now found in him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. You give him 15 minutes a day, you, you, I'm not kidding you. Statistically, not, I, I forgot what it was, I was, but nevertheless, it's very few people in the body of Christ that attend church read their Bible 15 minutes a day. Very few. The ones that do, it's amazing. 15 minutes of reading will give you enough scripture to meditate on for the rest of the day, and you will be amazed what that does to your mind and your spirit. It's just like when you go and exercise the body. And the Bible says that bodily exercise profits. Little. Little compared to your spirit and soul. But you, should, you still should do it. Look at somebody and say, you should exercise. Well, in the realm of the spirit, look at somebody and say, you should exercise. And in their soul, look at them and say, you should exercise. You should exercise. Exercise your spirit, your soul, and your body, your whole being. Get it to working for Jesus. You don't have to be like somebody else. Just be who you are in Him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. Jesus is the center of the universe. He's the head over everything in the entire universe. Through our union with him, we have experienced circumcision of the heart. Now the reason that he's talking about circumcision to them is because that was a big deal. And they understood physical circumcision because they knew that every male child had a commandment to be circumcised on the eighth day. Eight standing for new beginnings. Christ was circumcised on the eighth day. John the Baptist on the eighth day. I think it's quite interesting that now man knows, God knew then, that on the eighth day of every male child, the majority of the impurity of sickness and disease, it travels through your body because every person has that through the sin nature. It flows through your blood. The overwhelming majority of it is in the foreskin of a male child. And when they circumcise that child, the majority of the sins and sickness and diseases that would have attacked you in the future have been cut off. And by the shedding of blood, you've been cleansed. So there is a physical, symbolic revelation and understanding of physical circumcision. They figured if you weren't circumcised, you weren't even right with God. So they have to watch those little tales that come in today telling uncircumcised men, well, you're not right with God. No, God circumcises the hearts. Are you okay? That means he cuts out the impurities and the sickness and disease that's assigned against you and he gives you a pure heart. 
And through our union with him, we've experienced circumcision of heart. All of the guilt and power of sin has been cut away. And now it's extinct because of what Christ, the anointed one, has accomplished in us. See, I'm bold enough to say that I'm the head and not the tail above only and never beneath only because God said so. People say, you know, your wife died and I know you've got this problem and these problems with your kids and this and that. And, and, and I heard you, I mean, this has been said to me, believe me. And you say you're doing great, but you're getting better. Why do you do that? I said, well, first of all, you have what you say. And I said, I don't want to say what people want to hear. I want to say what God wants to hear. And God wants me to decree his work in me. And his work says he's doing something great. And I'm destined for even better. Why? Because I don't know it all yet. And I'm still on a journey of faith. I love my journey. What is accomplished for us? In verse 12, for we've been buried with him into his death. See, I've already been buried. I've already had a funeral. August the 28th, 1977. Had a funeral over at Catawba Baptist Church. My wife and I together got in a baptistry. And we got buried. And the old dead man and that old dead woman, they were just put away. Boom, they went under the water and they were gone. Our baptism unto death also meant that we were raised with him. I remember coming out of that water with a revelation knowledge. It wasn't the water that killed me and washed me away. It was the washing of the water of God's word that delivered me and set me free. Hallelujah. And we were raised with him. And when we believe in God's resurrection power, the power that raised him from death's realm, this realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp. But now, Look at somebody say, but now. Oh, my goodness. The but gods and the but nows. There's so many in here. He said, we've been resurrected out of that realm of death. I've been, I've been raised from that realm of death already. Never to return. Look at somebody say, never to return. Mm -mm, I'm not going back. For we are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. Forever. I'm forever alive. I'm forever forgiven of all my sin. See, don't you know Satan loves to have your relatives and friends remind you and remind you and remind you and remind you? I know what you did. I remember. I saw you in that store drunk. I remember you. I saw you at the club dancing on the bar and on the stands and on the tables and knocking everything over. I remember you. I know you. I know when you stole. I remember that. I remember when you shot up. I remember when you were snorting. I remember you, I remember you, I remember you. It's out there. Don't tell me you don't hear it. It's out there. And on top of that, your own mind. Sometimes nobody comes around and says anything, but here comes them birds flying over you with those bad thoughts. Remember you, yeah, you know what you've done. Yeah, you this, yeah, you, no, 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 no. That, that's the old flesh rising up. Buddy, you need to understand that baby's dead and buried. How many times are you going to have a funeral? I say, let's have one funeral and bury that rascal once and for all. Raised from the dead and know that you're a new man in Christ Jesus. You're the head and not the tail above only and never beneath. I don't look at what I've done because what I've done has been washed away and done away with. It's what he's done that is established and eternal. And I'm in what he did, not what I did. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to shout. Gets me excited. And then he said, the realm of death, never to return. For we are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. He counseled out every legal violation that we had on our record and our old arrest warrant. Oh, some of you had a warrant. Your old arrest warrant that stood to indict you. He erased it all. Our sins, all of it. Our stained soil. He deleted it. He knew what deleting was before they come up with computers. He was deleting. He deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved. 
Don't you let anybody try to retrieve your junk. Man, it's in the blood. Leave it in the blood. You got a new DNA. I'm telling you, when Satan knocks on my door and I open the door up, he does not see Larry. He sees Jesus and says, wrong address. I got to get out of here. <laughs> and it cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam, it has been placed unto the cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of consolation. The cross are to be a revelation of your public display that has been counseled. All your sins that were held against you, everything that you did that ought to send you to hell and keep you from God, counseled, wiped away. Pardon, as though the president pardoned someone. Pardon. Go back to your life. Go back to what you were doing. You're forgiven. Get out of that jail. Get out of that prison. You're released from where you are. Go get your new life. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of the powers and the principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon, every weapon, every weapon, and all of their spiritual authority, all of their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. He doesn't have any weapons or any power to accuse me because my warrant has been deleted. He has nothing he can accuse me of because he can't find it. Jesus wiped it out. Now, if he wants to find it, he's got to go to a bloody cross. And he's got to climb up to where the nails went through the flesh. And he's got to see, oh, I see where Larry's at now. He's been nailed to this cross, which means it's all counseled. So he's a forgiven man. Sets you free. That's what the blood does. Hebrews makes it real clear that your consciousness has been purged from sin. I don't, a sin consciousness is when you got, you got saved by somebody preaching about your sins. You can do that. You can say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. And you, you get your forgiveness and you really believe he's forgiven you. And you feel pretty good about that. And you're glad you're going to heaven. But you just walk around. But you, I don't understand why God would do that for me. You know, I might not really, really, really have it. Because I still have a bad thought. And I did say, I got up and cussed at somebody the other day in traffic. And I, I, did, I just, you know, and I did listen to some stuff I shouldn't have listened to. I, I, and you just start beating yourself up without understanding. Wait, there's a greater one in you that's bigger than every bit of that. 1 John 1, 9, if you fall, if you sin, confess it. Because he is faithful, he is just to cleanse and forgive you of what? All sins. Sins that you have committed, sins you're committing, and sins that you're going to commit. You keep it before him, he'll give you the wisdom to not keep walking back into it, but to walk completely out of it. Hallelujah. And forgiven while you're doing it. God is awesome. So, stripping away. From them every weapon, their spiritual authority and powers to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners. <laughs> oh, yeah. You remember he was gone for three days and three nights? That's what he's talking about. He was in the pits of hell leading principalities and powers around like prisoners. He went down to a place where other saints had died and been taken into prison in captivity. And Jesus is there unlocking every door with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He has taken every principality and power and put them under his feet. And now he's walking through the pits of hell to the point. In Matthew 28, it said, when he rose from the dead, all the dead saints rose with him. Everybody that had been descended into the earth from death, they rose with him. From the dead and walked the streets. Read your Bibles. Jesus led them around as prisoners in procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his, the scripture says. <laughs> and that's not. We got Jesus on the cross. Let's take him to hell. And they took him straight to hell. And as soon as they got there, they found out they really were in hell. Because they just took their prisoner and he made them his prisoners. Hello. So why would you allow anybody to judge you because of what you eat or drink? And they do. They do. You can't eat meat. You, hey, you're supposed to do this on Friday. No, you're supposed to do this on Saturday. 
Why would you let anybody judge you of what you eat or drink? Or insist that you should keep feasts and observe new moon celebrations? Or the Sabbath? Whoa. All of these were but a prophetic shadow and the evidence of what would be fulfilled for the body is now Christ. The body is now. See, if you're not careful, you just read that and go, uh-huh. How about if we say, and now you are Christ. You are the body of Christ. I don't care if you're the little toenail on the little toe. You're Christ. Don't you let anybody disqualify you from your prize. And don't you let their pretend sincerity fool you as they deliberately lead you into their, and I, I'm going to tell you something, this thing about the worship of angels. I've heard over the years so many people, we were having meetings and the angels showed up, and then we're going to have another one next week. We believe and the angels are going to come again. And the next thing you know, everything's about angels and angels. And they talk about how they can see into the spirit and they see the angels of God. Well, that doesn't entice me a bit. That's nothing compared to Christ in me. You got you see an angel on the outside of you. My Lord, have mercy. The creator of the angels living in me. Find out who you are and where you're at. Amen. Hallelujah. For the intention of angel worship. For they take pleasure in pretending to be experts of something they don't know anything about. Know a lot of them. Their reasoning is meaningless and it comes only from their own opinion they refuse to take hold of a true source the reason this book is so powerful is because it's not just a cute book written to talk about God it came from a man that was a Sanhedrin priest that thought he was doing God a favor killing Christians till God got in his shoes and his heart and showed him what was happening his eyes was turned he got the revelation of who Christ was and the next thing you know the man that was killing Christians is now they're all wanting to kill him not Christians but the Romans they're freaking out and it's amazing how bad they wanted to kill Paul and they never could do it he had to finish his course and finish his race their reasoning meaningless comes only from their own opinions they refuse to take hold of the true source but we receive directly from him and his life supplies valiantly unto every part of his body through the joining ligaments connecting us all as one. You're my ligaments. You ever had a torn ligament? Whew, it hurts, doesn't it? But boy, when your ligaments are in order, you're fast, you're accurate, you're strong. But if we break loose from one another, we become a torn ligament in the body. If one hurts, we all hurt. You see somebody limping, that's not just their leg that hurts. Their whole body hurts because of that one little area. Somebody says, oh, brother, you already know my problem. I got them all over. Well, then, then you can imagine if you got it all over you. I would say greater is he that's in you. Let the healing power of Christ begin to just come out of you. Speak to those things. Talk to those things. Speak to them. And then he says, we receive directly from him and his life supplies valiantly to every part of the body through the joining ligaments, connecting us all as one. And it says, he is the divine head who guides his body and causes it to grow by supernatural power of God. That's you and I. For you were included in the death of Christ. You were included. See, he died as you. Look at somebody say, he died as me. Yes, he did. Oh, I know he died for you, but he died for you as you and has died with him in the death of Christ and have died with him to the religious system and the powers of this world. Don't you retreat back to being bullied by the standards and the opinions of religion. For example, there are strict requirements you can't associate with that person. Or, hey, you can't eat that. Or, hey, you can't touch that. These are the doctrines of men that corrupt customs that are worthless to help you spiritually. Mm. How about that? Remember they got on Jesus? They were eating corn and they hadn't even washed their hands 
and they were upset about them eating with unclean hands and doing it on Sunday. They were hitting him with all the ordinances, and Jesus made it real clear. It's not what goes in the mouth that defiles the body. It's not eating with a dirty hand that ruins it. It's what comes out of your mouth that's ruining it. And he let them know, hey, Sunday, I wasn't made for Sunday. Sunday was made for me, the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The man was not made for the Sabbath. Religious tradition has you made for the Sabbath. Let me move on. Paul's having a good time here. And worthless to help you spiritually. For though they may appear to possess the promise of wisdom and their submission to God through the depravation, if I pronounce that correctly, of their physical bodies is actually nothing more than empty rules rooted in religious rituals. Paul's going, church, don't y'all let them get that junk back in you. Don't you do it. Whew. I want to keep reading, but that's the second chapter. <laughs> and uh, I really, I really want to keep reading. Let me read one verse, though, in, in verse three, chapter 3. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection, too. This is what we're going to start next week. His resurrection is your resurrection, too. I said his resurrection, it is your resurrection too. See, that needs faith come by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. One day you'll hear that very same thing and something will explode in you and you'll come and tell me that God showed you something. And I'm going to say what? And you're going to say that his resurrection was mine. How come you don't ever preach that, Pastor Larry? People do that to me all the time. You know why they think I never preached it? It wasn't revealed to them when I was saying it. But when it was revealed to them, it's like they'd never heard it before and wanted to know, why don't somebody tell that? I remember teaching on faith one day, and this sweet lady named Margie, she's been passed away 25 years. She was so sweet. And I preached on faith every Sunday for years. I mean, it's just, just faith. And she came up to me one day and said, God showed me something and told me to show it to you. I said, well, what is it? She said, it's right here in Mark 11:23." And I said, well, wow, what does it say? She said, well, it's talking about speaking to the mountain and casting it to the sea and not doubting in your heart and believing, believing in your heart that what you said with your mouth is going to come to pass. You have what you say. And I said, yeah. She said, are you listening to me? The Bible says that you have what you say. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, why don't you ever preach that? You know what? I was so glad she got it. It's true. So Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. And this is why we are to yearn for all that's above. For that's where Christ, he sits enthroned at the place of all power and honor and authority. Woo! Man, Paul was having this letter read to these churches. And these churches had not even seen Paul, but had heard about him. Like you hear about Billy Graham, but you don't know him. Well, that's the way it was, if you will. You know, I consider him much higher than Billy Graham. But at the same time, we can identify, we know who Billy Graham is. But most of you have never been in his home or know his family or went out to eat with him. Same way, they knew about the Apostle Paul. They knew about this Sanhedrin priest that was killing believers and got converted. And all these miracles are happening in his life. And all the power of God's moving. And how the governments are coming against him and they're locking him up in the prison. And how God keeps getting him back out. And how he keeps just touching the nations and the presidents of the nations. And God gets him back out again. And he gets back into it. And then he gets him back out again. And he just, and Paul just keeps taking it. And five times. He was beaten 39 stripes, save, well, 40 stripes, save one. But if it would have been a crucifixion, the 40th one would have been in the temple. If you weren't going to be crucified, they give you 39 stripes. That means his body was so severely ripped apart five times because those stripes were strips of glass and lead. That's what they made the whips out of. They were like fish hooks. And when it slashed to you, Mel Gibson is the only one I've ever seen do a movie that had a little reality to that, to that whip. And you remember it showed one when it, it wrapped around the man's ribs and it stuck to him. It just stuck. And the guy pulled it and when he ripped it, remember it, how it ripped the flesh? Those are the kind of beatings they got. This, this was not coming in there with a billy jack and popping him. That would hurt. This was 10 times, 100 times worse than a billy jack and just lay that into him and rip him open. 
I'm telling you. And Jesus took 39 of those stripes, and his 40th was the cross. And there's 39 major diseases in the whole world that medical science says that every disease that exists stemmed off of one of those 39. And by his beatings, bruises, and stripes, we are healed. Why? Because he has come into our bodies and he is the one living and ruling and that's why i can't afford to listen to the judgment of other people telling me if i'm right the way i do this and if i didn't do this correctly and didn't do that it's i have to hear that voice inside of me and follow him because the voices that come from the outside will always bring laws and rules and regulations but the voice inside gives me liberty and peace and freedom and gives me the liberty to lay hands on the sick to speak life over to other people for it's not me that liveth but it is Christ that lives in me hallelujah would you stand up on your feet with me today glory be to God he's worthy 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 to be praised today Heavenly Father, I just thank you as the words of our Apostle Paul that were written to the church to enlighten it, to educate it, to instruct it, to deliver it in every aspect of life. I thank you even in our mission statement we're to preach the kingdom of God and to educate the believer. That's exactly what just happened, Father. The kingdom was preached and the believers, they're being educated they're getting revelation knowledge by the Holy Spirit as we read and we're not listening to the mindset of men but to the mindset of God for I decree that I have the mind of Christ and therefore I have perfect peace for my mind is stayed upon him and perfect peace to the man whose mind is stayed on the anointed one Christ Jesus so I speak peace to you every one of you and since faith comes from hearing faith is released by speaking and acting so we're going to say a prayer it's going to cleanse our minds it's going to cleanse our hearts because of the power of the blood of jesus when we pray that blood will be applied to the doorpost of your hearts every sickness disease and death that comes to attack you has to pass over you until the accomplishment of the reason you was born is fulfilled nothing will take you out of this earth until god is finished with the purpose that he brought you you were created by him and you were created for him watch out or you'll get to thinking you was created so that god could just show people how you could have a good time in him no no you were created by him for him everything's about him him everything is him 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 so say this prayer with me say oh god I'm, i want everyone listen even if you're in here going i'm not sure about this listen if you would let what just went in you come out of your mouth you will be given the holy spirit the opportunity to confirm his word but you must say it because the bible says our confession makes salvation that word salvation come from sozo it means to be delivered protected preserved and made totally whole amen say oh god right now i ask for forgiveness of all sin all bad thoughts cleanse my heart i call my mind cleansed by the holy spirit and right now i receive christ and i will never be the same again he lives in me and i live in him he's my justifier He's my redeemer. He's my healer. He is my salvation and nothing else. In Jesus' name, I receive it right now in his precious name. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a big hand. He's worthy to be praised up. He's worthy to be exalted and magnified. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your goodness today glory to God his resurrection is mine how many of you gonna claim it if you need prayer for anything I'm gonna hang around and pray for you you got pain in your body you have a need come on down the rest of you as far as I'm concerned you're gonna what go do the word not know it go do it I love you God bless you